Well, hi there, and welcome to our Bible study on prayers and promises found in the Bible. We're on the Lighthouse Discord server today, and we're going to be talking about the Lord's Prayer. Before we begin, I thought it would be kind of nice if we read that prayer and prayed it as our opening today. And I'm reading this time from Luke 11, verse starting at verse 2. And he said to them, when you pray, say. And now here's our prayer. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now that's the Lord's Prayer, basically as I learned it. But these two or, th two or three verses actually read. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Then he goes, then he said to them in verse five, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a, and then verse six, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him and so the writer of Luke here or I should say Luke just kind of goes from like one topic almost right into another here in his instruction about prayer so I found that kind of interesting but um, anyway let's uh, carry on so we are talking here about the Lord's Prayer. And in Matthew 6, the first or second part of verse 8, and the first part of verse 9 reads, For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven. And that's again um, what was written in Luke comes from Matthew 6. You see, Jesus' best known parable is called the prodigal son. But the real hero of that story is actually the father. Why is that? Well, <coughs> excuse me, the son betrayed him, insulted the father, and broke his heart. And yet when the son came home, a broken man, his inheritance wasted. His father ran to welcome him home, receiving him again into the household, not as a servant or a hired hand, but as a fully restored son. And the Bible talks about salvation in many different ways, as a debt repaid, as a legal problem resolved, as a transfer of sin from the guilty to the innocent. But the image that goes right to the heart is that the old man running down the road to meet his ne'er-do-well son. When it comes to the kind of unconditional love that we all need, a parent's love is as close as we come on earth. Now we all respond to the idea of a father's love. Either we know what it's like from experience or we felt the lack of it all our lives. That's the truth. It's usually one or the other. And when Jesus gave his disciples a model for prayer, he could have addressed God in any number of ways. He could have said, our creator, our redeemer, our provider, I am. But instead, he chose to address God as our father. And in doing so, what he was saying is, 
you have more than an accountability to this God, which accountability is responsibility to another person. You have a relationship. So we're not just accountable to God. We have a relationship, an intimate relationship with him. And a lot of people that I've met across the years think of intimacy as, you know, that special time between a husband and wife, usually when children are created. And that's not the meaning of intimacy. It's, it's a much deeper experience, and it doesn't always involve that particular act. In fact, it means this closeness that we can have with God that we can't have with any other person. It's, I don't know how else to explain it than that. And in his book, Invading the Privacy of God, Cecil Murphy tells the story of a trip he took to a place of Christian education. He was emphatically told that the word father was not permitted there because many of the children related their earthly fathers with physical and emotional abuse or drug and alcohol abuse. And Murphy suggested this might be a good reason to talk to them about God the Father, their heavenly daddy. By the way, that word Abba that we hear used sometimes basically is that familiar term, daddy. The one who loves them above all others and would never hurt them. That's one of the reasons why when I write prayers or pray aloud, I very often use the term Father God. But he is our father far above anyone else. And so the woman remained firm in her no father rule, but Murphy vehemently disagreed. He had grown up without the understanding of a good father, but his heavenly father had seen to it that the first sermon he ever heard, and he was in his 20s at the time, was about the fatherhood of God. We were born feeling the need for a father's love. And as the first words of the Lord's Prayer remind us, we have a father in heaven. And he desires a relationship with each one of us. So to understand God the Father, we need to look at him through the eyes of his son. As Jesus taught his disciples the correct way to pray, he began by addressing God as father. And the New Testament Greek reads pater, P-A-T-A -A or E-R, basically pronounced patiar or patiar. Just a moment, please. <laughs> and it carries with it a tone of intimacy and purpose. Now, Jesus not only understood the intimacy God desires to have with his children, but also the intimacy we need to have with our Heavenly Father. And as we begin to speak to him, we should first seek who he is and set aside all negative thoughts we might have about fatherhood and allow him to fill a place each one of us has a need to have filled. Now, I had a father, and he was an adopted father, but my parents were adopted or had adopted me. But for some reason, I never measured up, and in other ways, I very much did. It was, it was an odd situation in my family, and it really has affected my brother as well as myself. And that's a long time ago, but... Why I'm sharing this is not to talk about my own family, but to say that when I first was introduced to Jesus, it was a brand new concept to me. We said the Lord's Prayer in school back then, but it wasn't something that I had ever really heard of. And it took me a while, like years, to really understand, but I was okay with Jesus. That I could get. But the love of a heavenly father, that 
took me close to a decade, I would say, before I actually understood what that meant. It's a shame that it took so long, but it did. And when it hit me, it God did amazing things in my life. So for me, salvation was that one-time experience, but it, as I've said many times, it was also a process. But to get back to prayer, <clears throat> excuse me, we need to try to look at him through the eyes of Jesus. And Cecil Murphy wrote this, Abba, Father, as I approach you, help me know that your hand holds mine, that you're always there for me to lean on because you hold me, that you're the true father, especially when I'm afraid, alone, and troubled. Amen. Beautiful prayer. Because Jesus loves us that much. His Father is with us when we're afraid, when we're alone, when we're troubled. So the second part comes out of Matthew 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, this is a familiar part of the Lord's Prayer. You see, <clears throat> the Jews had longed for the promised Messiah for hundreds of years. And their history had been the story of one oppression after another. They would get out from under one oppressor only to be oppressed by somebody else. Now it was the Romans who ruled over them. And quite honestly, the Jewish people despised them. But God had promised them a Messiah in Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, Micah 5, 2, and Zechariah 9, 9. And this Messiah would lead them to victory and to freedom. So the Jewish people assumed that this Messiah would be a great military and political leader who would rally them to fight the Romans and kick them out of Palestine. So they believed this Messiah would set up a new kingdom in Israel, returning the nation to the glory it enjoyed under David and Solomon. You see, what this meant is that the Jewish people were not looking for Jesus. Jesus was, to be sure, overcoming the oppression under which the Jews had suffered, and he was setting up a new kingdom. But none of that had to do with politics or the military. In John 18, 36, we read, my kingdom is not of this world, he said. And yet he also said, the kingdom of God is within you in Luke 17, 12. You see, friends, unlike the Jewish people, they thought that he was going to come or the Messiah would come with massive armies, you know, a huge military presence, many weapons, many people money to f battle they did not think that the messiah would come in the form of a baby born in a stable but something we need to understand here is that the kingdom of god has no geographical boundaries and the reason for that is that it's a spiritual state in which God's laws and purposes prevail in human affairs. Now, there, I don't know that you would have heard it this way, but theologians speak of the kingdom of God as being now and not yet. And it is now, insofar as it exerts itself anytime the people of God are motivated by God's love. God's will rather than the will of the world, basically. It's not yet, though, because the kingdom of God has not yet been revealed in all its fullness. I will read of Romans 8, verses 18 to 23. A great deal of Jesus' teaching in the Bible revolved around making people understand the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. 
and many of his parables began or begin, the kingdom of heaven is like dot, dot, dot. So perhaps it's not surprising that the first request in the Lord's prayer is your kingdom come. So to pray that prayer is to look forward to the full establishment of God's kingdom at some time in the future. But just as importantly, that prayer is a commitment to help establish the kingdom of God today and every day as we do God's will. You see, anytime God's will is done, his kingdom has come a little closer. So to pray for the coming of God's kingdom is to submit our will to the will of God. You see, it's kind of wrong or incomplete for us to think of our time here on earth and then to think of going to heaven. Because in essence, we're already in God's kingdom when we're believers in Jesus Christ. So yes, we reside here on this earth, but we are also residents of heaven. That's our kingdom. Watchman Nee wrote, there are three wills in the universe. God's will, man's will, and Satan's will. God does not remove Satan's will by himself. He desires that man's will become one with his will to deal with Satan's will. A spiritual prayer is an utterance of God's will. How useless is a prayer that merely utters one's own will. Our prayer cannot change God's will. It merely expresses his will. So what is that exactly? Let me try to unpack that briefly. When we pray a spiritual prayer, it would be like, Lord, I give you this day. I give you every part of my life. I, I'm speaking on behalf of myself here. I give you my marriage. I give you my husband's health. I give you our financial circumstances. I give you, you know, everything in my life. In other words, it's trusting God and asking God to take everything. But if all I pray is my will, so Lord, let me find part-time work. Give me this, give me that do this, do that, that's praying our will. That's basically, quite honestly, a useless prayer. Sorry, but our commentator says that, and I believe it. That's what Watchman Nee has written. So what does the Bible say about the kingdom of heaven? In Matthew 13, 24, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Matthew 13, 31, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. In Matthew 13, 44, it's like a treasure hidden in a field. In Matthew 13, 45, it's a merchant seeking beautiful pearl. In Matthew 20, verse 1, a landowner who hired laborers for his vineyard. And Matthew 25, 14, a man traveling to a far country. So what's part three of the Lord's Prayer? Matthew 6, 11, give us this day our daily bread. When God provided manna for the Hebrews in the desert, he was very specific. The Hebrews were to gather enough bread for each day and only for that day. And if they gathered extra, it would go bad by the second day, according to Exodus 16, verse 20. So manna was really daily bread in the truest sense. 
It came every day and it lasted a single day. The people had no choice but to trust in God's provision every single day. Can you even imagine? When Jesus taught us to pray for our daily bread, what he was doing was teaching us to trust in God's provision every day. We human beings yearn for security. God made us that way. But in our sinful natures, we tend to look for security in things like full cupboards and full bank accounts. We want to have an ample stock saved for the future. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because God in his mercy often provides for us in just that way. The danger of world plenty, however, is that it can sometimes give us the mistaken impression that we don't need God's provision each and every day. Do you see the danger in that, friends? See, unlike what these prosperity gospel preachers teach, God doesn't promise worldly riches to his people. But he does promise to meet our needs. And in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught his disciples not only to trust in God's provision, but also to be content with it. He prayed for bread, not steak and caviar. And as Paul said, the kingdom of God is not in eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14, 17. So the world promises to give us joy and fulfill our longings, but it never does. That's the truth. So the kingdom of God is about getting, setting our eyes on a spiritual kingdom. And have a look at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. So we live among the kingdom of the world, but we are to set our eyes on a spiritual kingdom. Give us this day our daily bread is a nod toward that physical realm. We have to be physically fed and we can count on God to feed us. But the brevity of the request shows that Jesus' heart is elsewhere. Contentment comes down to being so thankful for the things God has given us that we pay little attention to the things he has chosen not to give. David rejoiced in Psalm 63, 5, my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. In the end, God promises much more than daily bread. Spiritually, we are partakers of the bread of life. Look at John 6, verse 35 and verse 48. Or the bread of life, by the way, is Jesus himself. So as we learn to be content with daily bread in the physical realm, we prepare ourselves for the marrow and fatness of the kingdom of God. So when we ask God for what we need physically and spiritually for today, we are reminding both him and ourselves that we don't need most things. We should be content with what God gives us and we should be keenly aware that he never leaves us lacking. His provision is complete. And, you know, it's very interesting because depending on our age, we might want that PS5 or we might want the latest Xbox or we might want the most updated phone or the best gaming laptop we can get. Or we might want the nicest car or the biggest home or the nicest clothes, you know, or that for a, a girl, you know, looking to get engaged, that beautiful diamond ring, you know, or the, the fanciest hairdos or whatever it might be in this world. And there's nothing wrong in wanting something. But when we put that before God, it is because we need to be content with what we have and that's especially hard for a young person i know because i've been there i had a cousin who well two cousins um at the time one's not with us anymore 
And uh, her parents, their parents were able to give the kids everything. So they got vehicles, they had snowmobiles, they had ski lessons, they had skis, they had the top bicycles, like everything you could ever imagine they had. We never got those kinds of things, but we were content with what we had. And quite honestly, my family was not Christian. So I'm using that as an illustration, friends. And then we go on to part four of the Lord's Prayer. And this is a bit of a tough one. Matthew 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So Jesus told the story of a servant who owed his king 10,000 talents. And that story is found in Matthew 18, verses 23 to 35. And honestly, that was an astronomical sum because it would take many lifetimes to pay it back. But when the servant begged for mercy, the king forgave the debt rather than throwing the servant and his family into debtor's prison. But it wasn't long before that same servant was seen grabbing a fellow servant by the throat, excuse me, and demanding payment of a debt he owed. A man who had been forgiven millions of dollars in debt was ready to strangle another man over a few hundred dollars. And when the king heard about it, he was furious. He said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? Matthew 18, 32 to 33. He delivered the man to the torturers until his debt could be paid. Now, Jesus told this story in response to a question asked by Peter. Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? You see, Peter thought he was being generous, offering to forgive the same sin seven times. By telling the story of the unforgiving servant, Jesus was saying, in effect, you have need of limitless forgiveness. So why are you asking me about the limit of forgiveness you should offer? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, Jesus prayed. The grim story of the unforgiving servant shows just how much is at stake in that prayer. Forgiveness, which by the way, is the act of letting go of our own anger even righteous anger, friends, over a wrong another person has committed against us. Forgiveness is at the heart of the Christian life. And because we've been forgiven, every human interaction should be marked by forgiveness. People have sinned against us. People owe you debts. They owe me debts. And it's human nature to want to grab those people by the throat and shake them until we get some satisfaction. But God's forgiveness pulls the rug out from under us. When we consider the debt of sin that God has forgiven, we can't possibly justify an unforgiving attitude towards anybody else. We might view Jesus' prayer as a challenge. Are we truly willing to say, God, forgive me in the way I've forgiven others? Does the way we forgive others actually measure up to the forgiveness we need? Do we forgive others' debts? Ephesians 4.32 and Matthew 18.27. Those big debts as easily as we forgive the smaller ones. You see, we still have to fall back on grace in the end. We'd all be in trouble if God only forgave us as much as we forgive each other. As we meditate on the greatness of God's forgiveness, may our own habit of forgiveness grow to overflowing. I'm going to stop there and we can carry on with this. Actually, no, I'm sorry. Let's carry on. This last part, the Lord's Prayer, Part 5, Matthew 6, 13. 
And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's not easy to make sense of Jesus' request. Do not lead us into temptation. Why would God lead his people into temptation? Why would God put us in a position to fail? In the cartoons, it's always the devil who leads a person into temptation. He sits on the person's left shoulder whispering bad ideas while the poor little good angel sits on the right shoulder waving his arms and shouting, no, no, don't do it. And you probably wouldn't know this because it's an old cartoon, but I used to watch the Flintstones. I loved the Flintstones. And I would see Fred with the good angel or the, the devil and the good angel on either shoulder, just miniature friends, one dressed up in red like a, a devil, the other one dressed in white like an angel, and the two of them are battling each other by talking to Fred, and Fred's all confused on which way he should go. But when Jesus said, do not lead us into temptation, he was talking to God, not the devil. So it would be helpful to get a grasp on the word temptation as it's used in the Bible. In the Greek word, and I won't say this right, it's pirasmos, P-E-I-R-A-S-M-O-S. -E and it usually means trial or test. And a test, as we know, is only a bad thing if we fail it. If we pass, it's a very good thing because it confirms that we are headed in the right direction, learning what we're supposed to learn. Excuse me. In the great majority of instances in the Bible, Erasmus is used in a positive or neutral sense. The disciples, for example, experienced trials and tests, or Erasmus, and were strengthened by them. Trials and tribulations produce perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. I've put that verse up on the Bible many times over on the server. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, and that story is found in Matthew 4, verses 1 to 11. And that temptation was the last step in his preparation for public ministry. It was kind of like a final exam. And honestly, Jesus passed with flying colors. He had been fasting in the desert for 40 days when Satan appeared to him, offering him a whole new plan an easier plan than what God had in mind for Jesus. And he tempted Jesus to turn the stones at his feet into bread to ease his hunger. He tempted Jesus to throw himself off a high place to prove that he was truly the son of God. And he tempted Jesus with the promise of worldly power. But you know what? Jesus never rose to the bait. In each case, he simply answered Satan, with a word of Old Testament scripture and kept to his path. Now, no doubt that temptation was fresh in Jesus' mind when he prayed, do not lead us into temptation. It was a good thing in the end, but it was a very hard experience. The kind of thing he would prefer to avoid if possible. In the end, however, the important thing is that God is able to deliver us from the evil one. Bruce Chilton wrote, temptation was constant in Jesus' life, and he conveyed to his delegates the necessity of resisting it, not simply with one's own strength, but with prayer. You see the importance of praying the Lord's Prayer? It's not something that we all must pray every day but we can it's a sample prayer it's a good prayer it's something that is complete when we pray but what the lord is asking is for our hearts he is asking for us to turn our minds and our hearts towards him 
So the next section is the prayers of Jesus, and we're getting very close to talking about promises found in the Bible. But let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise, glory, and honor that you're with us. That you lead us, that you guide us, that you hear our prayer. That you know exactly what's going on in our lives. Exactly what we most need to accomplish your will. And so we pray for each one on the server today. We pray for each one represented on the server. All the different prayer requests that have been typed out those that have been spoken, those that are unspoken or unwritten, but are in our hearts, Lord, you know what they all are. And so today, I pray that you would meet each need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus and according to your will. In all things, may your will be done. And we will give you all the praise, all the glory, all the thanksgiving. In your holy name we pray, dear Jesus. Amen.